and welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingo. Hello and welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingo. This week on Fixing South Sudan, a brainstorm on how to reboot South Sudan's development and investment strategies. Can South Sudan emulate the ingenuity of regional business success stories like Rwanda, which was engineered by the Rwanda Development Board? What are the ways and means in which Africa's youngest nation can leapfrog into the 21st century? Joining us in the show to speak about how to fast track South Sudan's development and make it a leading destination for FDI is Parik Toby Madwood, an engineer and director of Economic Development and Regional Integration Program at the Secretariat of the International Conference on the Great Lakes. It's our pleasure to welcome him to Fixing South Sudan. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm doing great. You so nobody doubts uh, the amount of resources which we have in the Republic of South Sudan, but the potential is immense, but the challenges to tap into them are great. Where do we start? Yeah, like you said, the, the key word there is potential. Um, we have huge potential um, at South Sudan, both in resources and in, you know, the resources that are embedded in the geographical space that is South Sudan, both in uh, the strategic location that we are in in, uh, in the region. Uh, but of course we have so many uh, impediments that are standing in the way of us actually harnessing that potential into something that is beneficial, uh, both for our objectives of development and for our people after um, decades of conflict and uh, struggle for this country. We can talk about the strategies in a bit, but we have to talk about the fact that South Sudan, where it is, uh, is a country that is emerging out of conflict. So as a starting point, stability must be there. Yeah, stability is key. Um, um, of course, the legacy of the last few years after independence has been political instability, and I think that has to be addressed. Um, I think the promise of the the, uh, the peace agreement, whatever flaws that they may be, or whatever, whatever misgivings that any of the parties may have to it is that it is essential to getting us back on track. Um, we, have, we have already diverted from where we wanted to be and from the objectives of the struggle which is to, uh, to reward or to give dividends to the people of South Sudan in terms of development, security um, and a better livelihood for future generations. All those things are linked of course with the, um, with the ending of the conflict, persistent conflicts, wrangles of a power. And, and getting us back into a place that is stable that would allow for development to actually be pursued. And when the uh, conflict has ended, we pursue development, how do we go about that? In okay. your view? In my view, first of all, uh, of course, I've already mentioned that we need to uh, consolidate peace. Uh, and, and peace, of course, is not an event, it's a process, you know. So now we have the process of getting the peace agreement implemented, addressing the grievances of the parties that were uh, wrangling over power, establishing a government, but Ultimately, beyond that, we need to uh, reconcile our people. We need to make sure that people who are displaced, uh, people who are not in their natural, uh, in their home states, are returned there. And this is a huge responsibility for the government. We need to uh, demobilize many of the uh, of the fighters. All those things are linked uh, to creating the conducive environment for development to happen. Once that is done, of course, there has to be a concrete development agenda, a development agenda that is strategic, that is 
context uh, specific, which means it understands where South Sudan is, and it actually pulls everyone in the same direction. Um, the people of South Sudan will not be able to develop in silos. They have to all work together to, so that we can address huge illiteracy rates, we can address uh, the, the millions of children that are not in school, we can address the huge infrastructure deficit. All those things are connected to at least all the guns being put on the floor <laughs> and, and people focusing on development. There's a lot that we can learn and even from the region where you are based uh, as an expert on uh, trade, uh, what do we have to learn? We have been speaking about leapfrogging into the 21st century because South Sudan has the benefit of being born in this era and yet the leapfrogging hasn't happened. Yeah, theoretically, we have all heard the beautiful words about how we can learn from the mistakes of many other African countries that emerge from conflict. We are born actually in the 21st century. You know, many of the African states were born like in the mid 20th century. So basically, we have a situation where we could have benefited from this situational uh, advantage of being a country that is, and there was a lot of goodwill, of course, towards South Sudan. Um, the examples in the region, of course, suggest that what you need to do is you have to be intentional about your development agenda. You have to be very uh, realistic and practical. Um, and in whatever resources that you have, the international community, the regional community is always looking for where you are putting your resources and then they can support that agenda. Uh, so if the resources are diverted towards things that are, you know, causes for conflict and, 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 and if the political environment is not stable, of course, it is very difficult to get uh, support from, from friends and, uh, and, and, and neighbors. So that, that is critical, that we need to actually have a, an agenda that is assuming that we as South Sudanese have our own endowments, have our own resources, have our own natural ability and to focus and to invest in ourselves. And that would be the first step before we talk about investment coming from outside. Of course, that is critical, but it has to start with us. Let's flesh uh, out what you are talking about. In this program, we speak of fixing South Sudan. So what is your specific proposal for investing in ourselves and yeah. in our people? Yeah, in the spirit of fixing South Sudan. And of course, there have been many uh, beautiful ideas that, uh, that were uh, in this same uh, platform presented by many people. I think, you know, trying to move from the abstract where I was talking about investing our people into the practical or the concrete, I suggest or I believe that we need massive investment in our people. And in that way, I'm talking specifically about massive investment in education. Because I think, you know, the impetus for, uh, for moving us forward will come from the generation that is now still very young and that is actually locked out of whatever you can call a formal South Sudan, Sudan economy. So I'm proposing from this platform that we actually have uh, a surge in educational spending, you know, in all its sectors, primary school, secondary school, but specifically also vocational training. We talk a lot about diversifying away from the oil into agriculture, but we don't have the manpower to actually benefit from that diversification, to actually implement that diversification. So, you know, in the next five to, to 10 years, if we don't invest in our people, we have a whole another generation that would have lost because of the recent conflict and, and the non-investment in that. So you propose that we increase the spending on education and as we speak, uh, the budget is before the parliament and this discussion uh, is, is happening. So what, what would you say to those policy makers? Yeah, if I, if I was to be there at the, at, the, at, the, at the place where we are talking about figures and, if, you know, and this is an appeal to the legislators because they control the purse, at least in any, um, if they are representatives of the people, the budget that is passed every year is the law of the land in terms of allocating resources and appropriating uh, money. I would suggest that you know we have a massive investment in school infrastructure. At least, um, you know, if you look at the population of 12 billion people, assuming that is how many people are there, and about four million of them are school going, and we have a very a huge deficit in schools. Yeah. I think that if we were to massively invest and build 10,000 schools across South Sudan, you know, addressing this deficit for primary school, which is compulsory, but I believe that actually we should incentivize people that, you know, up to secondary level, we uh, pay for it as a country freely, and we com compel our communities to bring all these children back. It is critical that we do that because of multiple spillover effects that will come from that kind of investment. First of all, if we invest at 10,000, that's almost like a stimulus in terms of the construction sector. Mm. 
you know, we'll get our people working, you know, that is public works, that is employment for people that will build this, and they will have the pride of building schools in their community. It will have another spillover effect because we're draining the swamp of all these young people that are actually the fuel for conflict. If we're able to take this massive amount of people, within five years, these issues of cattle wrestling and these issues of uh, inter-ethnic um, violence and, and, and this, we are trying to disarm people that are carrying guns and they're 15, 17, 18 years old. Those people, if we move them out of there, you know, you would have huge dividends in the security sector. And because you're investing in the social development, you will see uh, uh, dividends in the security sector. We will also be able to employ a massive number uh, of young people, many, many of them working in the streets of Juba, in the educational sector. And we make that an incentivized uh, community rewarded uh, profession. Whatever you have studied, but we want to train you to be a teacher, and we want to teach the next generation of South Sudanese. That will address much. And this, of course, will bring us back to where we were at the beginning, which is economic development. All these people working and contributing even at the level of, of the counties and the payams, will actually change the lives there. It will reduce urbanization by, you know, not compelling people to move to Juba, but actually have something happening at the level of it. And as a result, we talk a lot about taking towns to people. If you take schools to communities, you'll be able to take towns to people. Automatically? Yes. Let me highlight the fact that, yes, the development needs are great, and you are saying that we should focus on the education. But what are those factors that are preventing us from achieving these ones? Well, I mean, I think uh, our priorities, uh, first of all, conflict has made it very difficult for, uh, for the public sector to devote sufficient uh, funds, you know, no matter the intentions, no matter the beautiful words we don't have. There, there are policy uh, challenges that yeah. we are facing. And if you look at how we are going about the development of South Sudan, it's not holistic. It is and it's happening in isolation. Everyone brings in the investor. In the case of Rwanda, it is the development board that does it. Are you proposing a similar thing for South Sudan? Yes, there is the investment authority. Yeah. There, are other also, there are also other institutions. Yes. So should we integrate all of them to, to work yeah. cohesively? At the level of, uh, of institutions, I believe that uh, the investment authority is uh, too narrowly focused. It should be uh, the South Sudan Development Board. It should be actually promulgated through a proper act that actually spells out its mandate uh, to address these issues. And it should be the repository of all the information, all the statistics, all the plans. You know, uh, you know, like uh, following the example of Rwanda, which is uh, instructive. And I think we can borrow some of the models. You know, the Singaporeans have done that. The Asian Tigers have done that. Um, and you know where we are as a country, uh, you know, with the level of illiteracy, with the level of underdevelopment, it's very difficult to have this thing be outsourced to private sector or you talk about investment. That development will not happen. It has to be centrally developed. This South Sudan has to be a developmental state. And that's a terminology in economics about countries that are focusing on development at the core of the national agenda. And having and clear, agenda. clear benchmarks that they must meet exactly. every year. Exactly. Exactly. and identify challenges that they have to yes. also solve. If you do that, you'll be able to actually make an impact. South Sudan will be fixed. It will be fixed ultimately because it will have so many spillover effects that are positive. Let's take a break. Welcome back to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor, and with us is engineer Parekh Toby Maduot, and we are speaking about how to spur South Sudan economic growth, overcoming some of the developmental challenges we are facing. And he says we should invest in our people. Human resource is key, and 
they usually talk about brain drain and brain gain. And in the diaspora, we have some of uh, our most well-educated people and they are not being attracted. So should we brain gain them to, to fuel our growth? Yeah, I think it's very important. I mean, if you see the passion that people in the diaspora have for South Sudan, even within this conflict, and some of them, of course, are fully immersed in the narratives about conflict and who's at fault and everything. Those same people are very passionate about South Sudan and they, and they want to be part of South Sudan. Obviously, almost every South Sudanese who went abroad had the idea that they want to go and equip themselves with the tools to come back, with the tools to come back and work in this country. So I think we need to make the environment conducive for them. Uh, the investment in the people actually can be supported by, by, by the diaspora. And the diaspora is a broad concept, of course, not just people in the West, but yeah. of course even our people that are here uh, in the immediate neighborhood and people who are left in Sudan. Uh, we need to make this environment actively peaceful and secure for people to come in. And they can come and, of course, make it even more stable. Um, so part of the human resource uh, uh, dividend that I'm talking about is not only, of course, the youth, but also investing in attracting people to come back uh, and leveraging the people who are here. I mean, there's so much idle uh, energy that is here because it is not completely focused on what can happen. That, that's a key point you are making because in South Sudan, we have a tendency not to... Uh, promote meritocracy, uh, it's not the right person in the right place, and you are saying that is uh, some of the constraints that might be overcome. Yes, some of the constraints, because I mean the mass, the, 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 the agenda that we have for development, when we talk about development, it has been mentioned in so much literature, the SPLM uh, jam paper, you know, the uh, many other papers that have been presented, you know, the vision of so many other uh, political and civil society groups. The problem is us recognizing that this is a massive task that requires all of us, requires as many people as possible. Um, so, you know, if, if space is not allowed for every people, everybody to come and join, of course, the work will not be done by the people who are sitting and trying to do it. You know, they need to harness the energies of the people. They need to actually actively go out of their way to make the agenda both transparent, open, and clear so that everyone can join in. Almost everybody is needed, even our mothers that are sitting in the countryside, they need to be part of this agenda and it has to be explained to them in their own understandable terms so that everyone is pushing in the same direction. I don't know if you mentioned the agenda loosely or are you saying that we must have a concrete agenda for developing yes, our country? I think we have to have concrete agenda and we have to actually put it in figures and numbers and everything so that we can actually hold ourselves accountable. How many kids are going to school? How many schools are we building? How many, uh, you know, community health centers are linked to those schools? How many students who graduated last year have gotten jobs and everything? So all those things, if we don't put them in concrete terms and we just talk about taking towns to people or we talk about, you know, South Sudan has great potential, we will be stuck in this same situation until our children are sitting here talking about this same agenda. I like to come back to Rwanda because what they have achieved is nothing short of a miracle. And I would like to highlight some key facts about Rwanda. Uh, which are amazing, uh, Rwandan parliament is 56% women. This is a first in the world. And uh, it's second best destination in doing business in Africa. That's also an achievement. Kigali is the cleanest city in Africa. And of the Rwanda's 12 million people, 50% of the workforce is between 16 and 32. And most importantly, uh, it has a strong and accountable institution. And as they say, it is corruption free. So when we talk about getting South Sudan to that standards and looking at you know, what we have been uh, identifying as key challenges of, of development, the war metric, uh, the refugees, and then you have the fact that you don't have uh, coherent development strategies it's someone will just say are we are you parek and mading daydreaming because the vision that we are projecting about south sudan is not where we are yeah i mean of course we, we are emerging but if you go back to rwanda in 1994 i mean they had like a million people killed within the space of 100 days um you know the whole infrastructure was 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 terrible uh, even in the capital uh, but what has happened is that uh, they, and I think that is the key to understanding their, 
um, uh, the Rwandan transformation is that they place their people at the center of, uh, of doing the change. They have articulated what it is that we need to get to emerge from genocide and, and address inclusiveness. Um, and of course, I don't want to paint the rosy picture of, of, of a paradise in Rwanda. They have their own they, challenges. Yeah. But the key was that they placed the people at the center and they said that people who would be given responsibilities would be held very, very much accountable. So those are the two keys, you know, and if you've been to Rwanda, they have this process on Saturdays at the end of the month where everybody comes out. My Uganda or something. Yes, yes, where they come and they do community cleaning. And the community including process, the president. Including the president and almost the whole uh, government. You have to have a good reason uh, not to be there. Uh, either you are traveling on official duties or, but everybody yeah, in the community. And of course, it is not even compelled. It is now something that people take pride in. They all want to participate in that. And I think the key, if you uh, look at how they, uh, they project the ideas from the level of the president to the rest of the people, is that they tell the people that you are precious, you are great, you as Rwandans can do this, you can build your country, it can be a middle-income country, it can be a developed country. So that is the same message that you need to tell South Sudanese. All these youth that are sitting here, they can transform this country. They can be innovators and entrepreneurs and provide jobs for their uh, their fellow South Sudanese, but we need to place the people at the center of this agenda. And we need to talk about it uh, extensively, especially the leadership, you know, using the bully pulpit to preach the idea of not only peace, but development, hard work and everything, and giving people the tools through the investment into what can change them. Let's emphasize the point you are making, that uh, people think that it's the government to take the lead, and yes, in some respect, you, you say that the government must do that, but also the people, yes. and for the people, and especially the youth. The youth have been uh, very loud on social media. They need jobs and what have you, and then even there is talk of regime change, which does not meet the everyday, uh, today challenges. So uh, what do you think the government needs to do for those youth who are in need of even uh, capital? to be able to start their own initiatives. Yeah, at the micro level, of course, you know, uh, we, we uh, as South Sudan, our, our government should invest in uh, innovation centers or in, you know, through the investment board or through the development board into uh, tapping and identifying the talent in South Sudanese that can actually come up with innovations that will not only help themselves, but help um, other youth, you know, in terms of creating jobs and addressing the social problems that we are facing. I mean, almost every business opportunity or every startup or every idea is addressing a, a social need. Right. So if you look at South Sudan, there are so many social needs, and I'm sure uh, our youth have the capacity, not only the youth uh, in the diaspora, but also the youth here, uh, to create uh, the solutions to their problems and also to the societal problems. But I think the government has to make that a priority. The government has to be dynamic. We need to place the uh, the youth agenda at the top of the priorities of the, uh, of, of the leadership. And I think if we do that, we will start to see some dividends, but uh, that is critical. And based on the statistics I was mentioning from Rwanda, only 20% is 50 years or above. Yes. And that is, um, it pales in comparison with our reality. Yeah, I mean, but we are also a useful society. I mean, almost all African countries are young, um, you know. Um, young, but not integrated. Not integrated, they are isolated. Of course, we have the huge problem of illiteracy and people not having gone to school, so of course, you know, when you're looking at that, they are not productive uh, uh, members of the formal economy. They are not contributing much because they have actually have huge uh, deficits in terms of capacity. But we, that's why we need to invest in them. But when you look demographically, and the African Union last year, I think it was the year, uh, 2017 or 2018, it called it the year of the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the dividend in terms of the, uh, of the age of the population in the whole African um, continent. And we need to harness that to try to invest in these young people because those young people, and not only young, but even the uh, slightly older people emerging from university, the current university students, we need to really invest in them and tell them that you know their innovation will be the one to actually build South Sudan into something. Otherwise, we would be like some countries uh, mired in conflict. And of course, that energy of the youth, if it is not being divert directed to something positive, it will find other ways. Uh, to impose its will, which is conflict, and mm. what we are seeing in some areas. Lastly, the regional dimension. We are members of East African community, and there was a lot of debate about whether it was premature or not, but nevertheless, we are members. Yes. 
yes. and you are based at the region talking about integration, how can South Sudan harness this regional uh, potential that exists? I mean, there, there are so many opportunities for South Sudan. Of course, you know, we have debated the issue of the East African community, especially more than five years ago when it was still uh, at the early stages. And But now we are in the East African community, which is a, a regional economic community, so it has obligations. And, 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 and so at, at the stage that we are in, we may not be all the, all the dividends, but we need to start preparing ourselves so that we can compete in the future and benefit from regional integration. At the ICGLR where I work, um, and especially in the department I, uh, I lead, we have been working on investment promotion into the region. You know, we held an investment conference in Kinshasa two years ago, and that was focused on bringing investment into all the 12 member states. And, and South Sudan was identified as one of the beneficiaries through the uh, uh, Nzara Agro-Industrial Complex. And Nzara is a huge mm. project that can actually be uh, something that we should invest in. Um, and we are still promoting it. We're going to have an, another investment conference in Kigali uh, at the end of this year. And we want South Sudan to actually advocate for itself. So to benefit from the regional initiatives and even the international initiatives, South Sudan has to get serious the investment uh, board has to be very proactive and actually be an advocate and a champion for South Sudanese uh, projects and also educate the general public about the potential of the projects. If we do that, we'll be able to harness some of the benefits, not only from the region, but internationally. Parangwadwa, thanks for coming to Fixing South Sudan. Thank you very much. Have you fixed South Sudan? No, not yet. But Has I'm South Sudan fixed you? <laughs> not yet. Thank but you. But South Sudan has uh, great potential. Hey!